my fellow Toastmasters, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be across the world watching this video. My name is Toastmaster Harry Elias, and I come from Palu Nusantara Toastmasters Club. And in this video, we are going to look particularly at the role of the grammarian. The first question you're going to ask is, why did I volunteer to become the grammarian? But really, now that you have volunteered and you are the grammarian, the first question you should be asking is, who is the grammarian? And in particular, what are you expected to do? You essentially have four roles and they are on this particular slide. Let's go through them very quickly. The first thing you do is to introduce your role. And this actually happens at the beginning of the meeting. The general evaluator or the Toastmaster of the meeting may say, for example, our grammarian for this evening is Toastmaster Harry. Harry, would you please introduce your role? And that is when you will introduce your role. The second thing that you do is to choose and introduce the word of the day. And we'll talk a little bit more about choosing the word of the day later in this video. The third thing that you do is to listen to the use of English during the meeting. And finally, when all is said and done, you will do what is called the grammarian report. And the grammarian report usually happens at the end of the meeting. The general evaluator will introduce you and ask you to deliver your grammarian report. So let's start at the top first, introducing your role. Now it isn't as difficult as it seems because Toastmaster International has actually given you a script and all you will need to do is to amend the template and to read out your script clearly and succinctly for your audience. What I'm going to do now is to read the script aloud. Why? Because I'd like you to pay close attention to the stress and the pauses when you are reading your script. I'm going to put on my trusty spectacles now, simply because best biopia actually hits us all eventually. So here you are. Let's say the general evaluator has said, Mr. Grammarian, Toastmaster Harry Elias, would you please introduce your role? And this is what you say. My fellow Toastmasters, as grammarian, it is my responsibility to pay close attention to all speakers, listening carefully to their language use. I'll take note of any misuses of the English language, as well as any outstanding words, quotes, sayings, or thoughts. As grammarian, it is also my duty to introduce the word of the day. For today's meeting, the word is, which means an example of using the word is in the sentence. Each speaker is encouraged to use the word of the day. I will give a word of the day report and grammatical usage report when called upon during the meeting. Thank you, my fellow Toastmasters. Simple, easy peasy, grill and greasy. What I would suggest you now do is to take a pause in this video and read it out to yourself. If at any time you feel that you haven't got it 100% right, simply go back about a minute in this video and listen to me and you can read along with me just to give you the confidence. And that, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow Toastmasters, is how 
you introduce your role. If you remember, the other thing that you do, or the second of your checklist, is to introduce, to choose and introduce the word of the day. So let me say a few things about the word of the day. Toastmasters International actually says that it is the grammarian's duty to choose the word of the day. Now, here's where it becomes tricky because you need a balancing act. And let me explain myself. On one hand, you want a word that is interesting. Choose a word of the day that will extend the vocabulary of your fellow Toastmasters. But on the other hand, you do not want a word that is so out of usual practice and usage that even if you use the word, most people will say, what was he talking about? So let me give you an example. The word poise, P-O-I-S-E. That would be a wonderful word as a word of the day, simply because it's a beautiful word. It's an interesting and unusual word, but at the same time, it's not a word that you cannot use in everyday conversation. So those are my recommendations. Choose a word of the day that is appropriate. Not too difficult, but interesting enough to make people's conversation pop. The other aspect of choosing the word of the day is that in practice, most grammarians don't choose the word of the day. This is usually done by consensus or the committee, the exco of your club. They would get around or maybe a way out group, a WhatsApp group would be bandishing words, brandishing words of the day around. And then by consensus, most clubs would then come to determine the word of the day. But as far as Toastmasters International is concerned, it is actually the grammarian's responsibility to choose the word of the day. Let's carry on. So the first box is ticked. You've introduced your role. You've chosen and introduced the word of the day. What's next? What then do you have to do? Now, the first thing to do is to listen to the use of English during the meeting. And this is what happens during the meeting. And it, just to remind you, you are listening because at the end of the day, you are going to report on the use of English at the grammarian report part of the meeting. Things that a grammarian listens out for during the meeting. Everyone says, well, use of language. What does that actually mean? I put on the slide three things that I personally like to listen for. The first is mispronounced words. The second, grammatical inaccuracies. And third, interesting words and quotes. So those are the three things that you need to do and look out for during the actual meeting. Let's go to mispronounced words. Let's say you heard the word because, because, rather than because. What you need to do is to take note of that mispronounced word. So at your report, you would say, for example, I heard one of the speakers say and use this and say the word because, because. So the first thing you do is identify the word. Then you could say, for example, I think that it is pronounced because, because, because. And at this juncture, you would then start to do drilling. And just let me demonstrate how you can do that. My fellow Toastmasters, I heard the word because, one of the speakers said because. The proper way to say it is because, because. So I'm going to say it again, listen carefully. Because, because, because. Can everyone please unmute themselves and say because? Come on, try it out. Fantastic. That's exactly how to say because. Now, the next word I heard mispronounced is blah, blah, blah. 
And there you go. Now, here's an important thing to remember. When you are doing mispronounced words, you don't want to identify the Toastmaster or the guest mispronouncing the word. We should always remember that Toastmasters is inclusive and a safe place for which to learn words. So you don't want to say, Toastmaster Harry said this and this is wrong. It's counterproductive and embarrasses our guests as well as the Toastmasters. Now, the second group of things that you would be listening out for are grammatical inaccuracies. And here's a short list of common mistakes. Things like the single plural form, you might hear the word peoples, or the most common problem is Toastmaster and Toastmasters. It's Toastmasters International. It is a Toastmaster, a single and a plural form of the words. You can point that out. The other common mistakes are tenses, past and present. You might heard someone say, when I go to my holiday last year, and it should be, I went on my holiday last year. So tenses, past and present, that's a simple thing to listen for. But I would advise you, please do not list out every inaccuracy you hear. I have been personally to meetings where the overzealous grammarian had listed out nearly 50 over grammatical inaccuracies. It is quite counterproductive. It doesn't really help anybody. And one really learns from it. So there you have it. That is my recommendation. And again, just like when you're doing the last report, don't point out the Toastmaster or the guest who made the four part. The person, the guilty, should remain anonymous until at least the end of the meeting. And now we come to my most favorite part of the report, which is interesting words and quotes. Remember when I said, don't point out the Toastmasters who made the mistakes? Right. In this particular part of your report, you should say the name of the Toastmaster who actually contributed an interesting word or quote. And what are they? The same way that you do it, you identify the word or the phrase. So you could say, for example, I heard Toastmaster Harry use the word poise. Poise. Now, poise is a wonderful word, blah, blah, blah. And there you go. Explain the word or the quote that you heard again to all the Toastmasters who were at the meeting. If you need an explanation or a definition, simply use Google. In the old days, I used to simply bring a small pocket dictionary with me to the meetings, but now everything's right here on the handbook. Find out exactly what is the proper definition of that wonderful word or Google the phrase to get the proper accurate meaning of the word. Now, how do we raise the bar? How do we make it even better? So on this slide, I put four different things that you should acquaint yourself with before you become a grammarian. Alliteration, metaphors, similes, and puns. And whenever I am the grammarian and I hear these four things, I get really excited because it gives me a chance to compliment and praise the Toastmaster who used them. In case you're not sure what they are, you can Google them. But basically, an alliteration would be, for example, the big boy bullied the smaller boy by using his battered boots to kick him. Right, lots of bb 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 bb. Let's call it alliteration. And the Toastmaster, who in his speech used an alliteration, deserves your praise. So praise that person. There are also metaphors. Some people would work metaphors into their speech or even their table topics uh, speeches. And you really want 
to praise him. Similes is, for example, the man went into the room and the room felt as cold as ice. That's a simile. A pun would be, for example, this series, Rock Your Roll, which is a pun on rock and roll. What you want to do is to praise and to recognize these interesting uses of English. So now that you've done all that and listened to the entire meeting, it is time to prepare, organize, and organize your grammarian's report. How do we do this? Now, again, Toastmasters International have very uh, conveniently shared a document with us. And you will see on this document, column title and text. Now, if you are like me and you're a digital dinosaur, we don't like all these typing, typing into a computer. I simply actually use paper and a pen. And what I do is I simply draw a line and divide this blank piece of paper into four parts. Obviously, the first part is to look at the grammar, the second, the vocabulary, the third, mispronounced words, and the fourth, the number of times the word of the day is being used. And I simply write whatever I hear in terms of those four quarters, and I'm organized. But it really is a matter of style, and I leave it to you to decide what works best for you. Now you are going to deliver your grammarian report. And as you're delivering your grammarian report, you will simply have that one sheet of paper. We start off by an introduction and you congratulate everyone for their good use of English. In this report, you will also like normal evaluations would be a sandwich structure. So you start with the good. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow Toastmasters. First of all, please give yourself a round of applause for a wonderful use of English this evening. Then you deal with mispronounced words and drilling. And why I do this is because it involves the audience. The audience actually participates by unmuting their microphones and saying words, and that engages your audience. The next thing that I usually do is to deal with grammatical inaccuracies. And as I said, please, a maximum of three. The recommendation is purely mine. It's purely mine. TI does not suggest make any such recommendation. It is my recommendation because if you just come for the grammarian's report and you hear 10 or 20 grammatical errors, it really doesn't teach anyone very much, in my view. The fourth thing I do is then do the interesting words and phrases and do as many as you can, because this is the time to heap praise. And don't forget, we are all into having very positive feedback for the grammarian uh, during every single evaluation, including the grammarian's report. Now, the last thing I do is the conclusion. And I announce the word of the day with fan fan plump. And I might say, Toastmaster Harry, congratulations. You use the word of the day 12 times. A round of applause. Everyone, Harry deserves a round of applause. And that is how you deliver your grammarian report. So those are the four things that you do. Why become the grammarian? I think there are three reasons why I personally become the grammarian. First, it promotes active listening. Being a grammarian is one of those roles where you can't run off and have a cup of coffee during an online meeting. You really have to listen to what people are saying during the entire period of the meeting. The second reason is it improves my grammar. I always learn something new, especially if you go to a more advanced Toastmasters club, you could actually learn lots of very interesting phrases as the grammarian. 
And the third reason why I become a grammarian is because I view it as an extended table, table topic. Because you can't prepare. You don't know what you are actually going to say as the grammarian. And you have to do it all on the fly. You are listening, organizing your speech, and then delivering it every time you become a grammarian. So thank you for watching. I hope I've shared with you some insights on being a grammarian. And it's Toastmaster Harry signing off from Indonesia. All the best. Have fun and rock your role as a grammarian at your next meeting. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Harry. Thank you for myself. I hope you enjoyed that. And as I said, there is an extended video that goes on for about 22 minutes where I actually demonstrate how to do it, how to introduce your role, how to read those things, how to do drilling. And you might find that interesting. So I didn't want to bore everyone tonight. <laughs> I just wanted to keep it short. And I will now take questions. I have to moderate my own questions. So sad. Right. Miranda is overworking me. Okay, go ahead. I'm happy to ask answer questions on. Go ahead. Uh, hi. So um, you mentioned that um, as a grammarian, um, it's not recommended that you, that you point out who made a mispronunciation or an error in grammar, but. Every time after a table topic session, when we do the role play reports, when the grammarian comes up, doesn't the grammarian always have to list that list the the participants in the table topics and their and their use of grammar? No, you don't always have to. I find it quite counterproductive. Can you imagine if I said Aaron made this mistake? and it's a common error. How does Aaron feel? What's the learning objective? When I, for example, in a meeting two weeks ago, someone instead of France said French. I am having French professors coming to French, French, French. Instead of France, she said French. When I corrected that, obviously I did not use her name, but the person listening to the correction knows that they are the ones who made the mistake. I think it's very important to protect and to give a sense of safety. We are all learning in a safe environment. And that is why I do not recommend that you actually point out the names, Aaron. I don't okay. recommend that as a, as, a, as a way of being the grammarian. Okay, so when doing the grammarian report, I just say, like, okay, during the table topic session, um, Someone mentioned this line. Uh, you could just say, I heard. During the table topics, I heard she goes to the market last week. Okay. Uh, the proper way should be, could anyone recommend how that should be done? She went. Good job, Erin. She went. And self-correction, you might get the person to correct themselves and then peer correction as an alternative. But I would not name the person, and I highly recommend that grammarians listening in do not do that. By all means, name those who use the wonderful words, the wonderful quotes, that's praise. It's all praise, praise, praise. But when you want to correct, let's do it anonymously because the person who made the mistake knows she made the mistake or he made the mistake. Okay. There's nothing to be gained by saying, Halina, you made a mistake, blah, 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 blah. Thank you. A difficult question for me. Testing me tonight. Go ahead, Jai. Jai, you are muted. Oh, sorry, you yeah. like to unmute yourself. Yeah, first of all, Harry, I yeah. love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, my question is something I've observed happen in meetings quite a few times. You may have already have mentioned this, if it's on the slide, I couldn't see it. But my question is, uh, not all of the members in a meeting will be good in their grammar. And sometimes the grammarian himself in the report is making a mistake. Those who know the grammar, listen to it and go, I, I've had times when I'm going, no, 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 he's wrong. 
but I don't mention it. I just keep quiet. But how would you advise that if the grammarian feels that he or she is not so good in grammar to run it through somebody he knows is very good in the language before presenting the report? Thank you for that question. Jai's question goes back to the issue of should you volunteer yourself as a grammarian? Mm -hmm. Now, it helps if you have a degree in English or you use English uh, in your work. So obviously you have an added advantage. But having said that, it's not really necessary to be an expert in grammar. You don't have to be an English teacher to be a grammarian because at the end of the day, you're going to have a lot of mispronounced words, wonderful phrases and quotes, which can form the basis of your grammarian report. So you might not dwell too much on grammar. Now, what happens when I hear a grammarian correct, correct in inverted commas, in case Jai can't see this, right? You correct when actually no correction was necessary. I simply cringe a little bit and like, all right, it's all right. So we have different levels. There are grammarians and there are grammarians, okay? And if you're lucky, you get a grammarian who really knows what they're talking about. And then you get a lot of education. Then you get a lot of education. So choose your grammarians properly with care, with consideration. Make sure the person is really up to it. Don't just stick somebody's name in there. We need a grammarian. Could you be a grammarian, please? Because the person may be totally out of the debt and there's a difficulty there. I 